Okay, so let's get started. Thank you everybody for joining. Uh, for the next hour, we have a, a discussion and an exploration around funding. So clearly some of you are maybe interested in getting money or giving money or in how this whole entire industry is evolving. So my name is Slava Rubin and I'm uh, one of the founders and CEO of Indiegogo. And uh, we're just gonna explore this for 10 minutes first up front. In my opinion, the 80s was all about desktop computing. The 90s was all about online commerce. The 2000s, all about social. And in my opinion, by the end of this decade, it will go down as the decade of funding. And uh, we'll have some of that debate in the next uh, 60 minutes. So typically, when you think of, let's see, this works. Typically, when you think of getting money, it's quite a clear proposition. There's the idea and there's money. It's quite, as they say, linear. So linear that back in the day, in the 20s, there would be lines for people waiting to talk to the person at the bank trying to get a loan. And they were waiting for that person who makes that decision. Then the next person would go in and say, hey, can I get money from your organization? You, one person or a group of people, will make that decision for me. But why does it have to be so linear? I mean, this is back from the 20s, yet yeah, that's exactly what's happening today still. But if you fast forward, it doesn't have to be that way. There could be much more of a feedback loop that happens. With Indiegogo, there's a lot more that you get when you actually try to get money than actually just the money. There's being able to test your marketing and be nimble before you actually spend lots of cash taking it out to the market. Or you could get more promotion than you ever could have gotten on your own. One of the key things is market validation. I know Sonny was just up here. Sonny was able to use his $900,000 raise on Indiegogo to later, within a year, be able to get a $15 million investment. Perfect market validation. And then in my opinion, the most important thing that you get is actually the data. Very often when you get money, you get very little data associated with that money. But here, you're getting money and you're creating relationships. Instead of just a one-off transaction where you never know who this person is, now you get to create a relationship where they're with you forever. And obviously, the money is a really nice benefit as well. Anybody know what this is? Awesome. The Pinono, German made, totally local guys. Are any of you German? This is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, fully funded campaign in Europe. Just closed and premiered at CES, $1.25 million. The first camera over 100 megapixels. 36 cameras connected through algorithms that the ball will take a photo and capture the entire 360 degrees in one moment. 45 countries funded this. And it was one of the big hits at CES. But the idea of feedback is not new. This is uh, back during the gold rush in the US, there was a lot of covered wagons using Canvas. And people were trying to be able to find all their gold and they weren't having the right clothing. So finally, Levi Strauss decided to actually create clothing out of the canvas instead of covered wagons. So the fact that the technology was already there, I'm calling it canvas, didn't matter. It was the new application of the similar things. And clearly, some of you are even wearing jeans today. This is now 150 years later. So the concept of feedback is really important more than just the did you get a hundred dollar loan or a million dollar loan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When Indiegogo got started, it was the two co-founders and I of a mutual frustration of trying to raise money using the internet. And for us, we want to be able to have anybody be able to raise money for any idea. We break down the world into three major categories: creative, entrepreneurial, and cause. 
So let me just give you one example of each. So last uh, summer, a couple, several months ago, in the cause space, clearly there was a revolution that was happening in Turkey. And I don't know if you know if you remember, but it actually started on the weekend. The reason this is relevant is because it starts on the weekend, and um, some people's politics will say that obviously Turkey was holding them down in terms of the communication getting out. So on Monday morning, a campaign got started on Indiegogo to be able to try to raise the voice of global Turkish thought, which is, let's get a full-page ad in the New York Times. That ad would cost $52,000. By Tuesday, it was fully funded at $108,000. Wednesday, negotiated with New York Times. Thursday, final implementation and feedback on the actual words that would go into the ad. And on Friday, the ad was in the New York Times. The following week, thousands of media outlets were covering it, and precisely what Turkey didn't want to have happen was happening because of this campaign by the global citizens. So, with $108,000, people were able to get a voice that was then implemented. Or here's the Scanadu Scout, another device in the medical space. They were able to raise $1.7 million out of $100,000, but that's not the key. The key is the fact that they were able to use all that information and data to push forward their FDA approval. And the FDA actually wants to speak with their funders. So it's not just about the money. Then yes, they do follow this up with a $10 million investment from VCs. But we want to know what's cool, talk about global here at DLD, 110 countries fund this device, and if you're wondering what it is, it's a doctor in your pocket. The first medical tricorder, like straight out of Star Trek, okay? So they were able to raise this money to monitor your health. Or I don't know if any of you know Roger Ebert, but Roger Ebert is a pretty famous critic who just passed away, or if you're familiar with Sundance. But the movie called Life Itself, which is a documentary about, about Roger Ebert, just premiered two days ago. It got funded on Indiegogo. Okay, movies getting funded on Indiegogo, nothing special. But for the first time ever, a movie premiered at Sundance physically, and at the same exact time, any of you were able to watch it from your couch if you funded the perks on Indiegogo. Never before has the Academy allowed that to happen, meaning the Oscars. Never before has Sundance allowed that to happen, and never before has any premiere festival had that happen. So without having to attend, you were part of the actual premiere. The idea of democratizing anything is not new. The telephone is obviously one of the things that democratized communications. This is an interesting kind of adoption curve of actually telephones in terms of the number of phones per thousand people. The reason I'm showing you this is this is over 40 years, and here's the Indiegogo adoption curve in six years that we've existed. It's fairly similar, but the idea is that it's in a new space, it's in funding. Now keep in mind that the telecommunications curve I showed you stopped in 1920. There was still a lot of advancements that happened since 1920, which is why I'm trying to set this up as we're not even getting started yet. This is going to be the decade of funding by the time we're done, nevertheless where this will go as we will discuss in the panel in just two minutes. But see, this is all actually speeding up. The feedback loops are getting faster. You're getting more information, more precise information, more actionable information to be able to do what you want with it, not just actually getting money. See, some people say we should do business plans to get money. But see, business plans should be in libraries right next to Isaac Asimov for science fiction. If you're able to write a good business plan, you should be a creative writer. If you actually want to start a business, you should start a business and actually get feedback right away. Actually find out what the marketing traction is, what the actual sales traction is, what the messaging traction is. And all of this is actually speeding up. But see, the idea of feedback loops or the communications curve moving up or how many phones per thousand people or how many campaigns Indiegogo has launched and that was the curve there, it's meaningless. What people actually care about is the result. The fact that you had phones now is you could communicate with other people and tell them I love you, or say I'm going to be late, right? And with Indiegogo, it's actually all these amazing campaigns that are happening. So this tile is actually just many different represented Indiegogo campaigns, and it's just to show you how rapidly this is happening. Just 48 hours ago, the Jamaican bobsled team actually was able to qualify for the Sochi Olympics. 
This is straight out of like Cool Runnings, the movie from Disney. They haven't been in the Olympics now for three Olympics in a row, but now they've qualified, but they don't have the money. And two days ago, a campaign got started on Indiegogo to send the Jamaican bobsled team to Sochi. So if you want, in a few weeks, when you're watching the Olympics, if you want to be part of the Jamaican bobsled team, which you can, just go Indiegogo, just search right now, Google it, Indiegogo, Sochi, bobsled, and you can fund the campaign. It's already moving quite rapidly. With that, um, thank you. And my Twitter is at GoGoSlava. And now we're going to dive into a 50-minute discussion with Simon taking the lead. My name's Simon Levine. I'm a, uh, a tech investor, a VC, and uh, I'm delighted that we've assembled a great trio of panelists to talk about the future of funding. Slava's already done a great job introducing himself and his company. Let's hear briefly from Philip and Raphael. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Philip Murring. I am responsible for everything in Europe at Angelist. Angelist is a platform for startups um, that can help them transact their high value transactions. So that's everything from hiring talent, but most importantly, fundraising. Um, and we started about four years ago in San Francisco. In the last year, we've put about 120 million into about 500 uh, startups across the world. And um, we've launched a new product that I think um, is most important for Angelist itself and also most interesting for investors and startups, which is called Syndicates, which basically allows uh, investors, angel investors, to pool money around them and build ad hoc venture funds for startups or a series of startups. And um, in the past few weeks, we've already uh, closed a bunch of syndicates with some great investors in the US. And um, yeah, that's what I think we're going to talk about mostly when talking about Angelist. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Raphael Jonen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Aux Money. Aux Money is a German um, platform that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer lending. So we make it very easy for um, people, investors, to invest in other people. And um, this is about consumer loans. So what happens is the borrower goes on the site and um, applies for a loan. Then we, we check those borrowers. We exclude 80% of the borrowers up front. So it's only a platform for credit-worthy borrowers. Um, then we, we score, we price the borrowers, we set the appropriate risk-adjusted interest rates, rates, and investors can then invest in these private individuals. Um, we've been around for six years now. Um, we are based in Dusseldorf. And um, yeah, looking forward to speaking about what differentiates the different models here. So, so th this is the, uh, I guess, the money panel. There are three different kinds of uh, crowdfunding entities in front of you. Uh, Raphael just described his company. It's really a lending company. Um, AngelList is a, uh, a listings marketplace for equity investing. And Slava, at the moment, is a, a place where, a site where you can donate or fund uh, projects and causes, but not necessarily receive a, pro a profit from it yet, although I think he'll go into explaining that that may change over time. So we have lending, equity, kind of donating and, and project supporting. Uh, I guess my first question is, all of these kinds of markets have existed, as Slava pointed out, you know, for hundreds of years in the offline world. What, what's different about what the internet brings that is changing the dynamics of these industries broadly ac across all three? W would one of you like to take that? So in our case, uh, crowd lending, the, the incumbents obviously are the banks that have been around forever. And the banks mainly were set up to collect capital for multiple people and then lend it and invest it to other people. But now with technology and the internet, there's basically a more efficient way of uh, allocating this capital, which is directly from, from the people to other people, i.e. from the source um, to the recipient of the capital. And by doing that, by using technology and the internet, we make 
Aux Money makes this process, process much more efficient um, so that basically both sides, i.e. the borrower and the investor, benefit. The borrower benefits in terms of uh, an attractive interest rate, which is more competitive. Uh, than, and what is that rate? I mean, it varies because we have risk-adjusted pricing. Roughly. Uh, it, it goes from 5% to um, 15%. And, and what's the average? So, so the average... The average rate. loan size, so an AUX money borrowers can take a loan between 1,000 euro and 25,000 euro. Just give me the average for the panel to help them understand. Okay. For the uh, 7,000 euros is the average loan size that a borrower takes on AUX money. Um, we offer maturity from one to five years. The average is three years. Um, and, and the average borrowing rate is 9%, is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, that's the average rate and, that and the borrower if I, pays. if I was to lend money on AUX money, what would I receive for that as, so looking, as a lender? Yeah, good question. Looking back at five years of history, um, the average return for investors have been around 6% net okay. return. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, for us, the um, again, it's it's basically the same thing for for AngelList. Um, startups have fundraised for hundreds of years before. They only called startups for um, say 15, 20 years, uh, but it always has been extremely difficult to get access to business angels, venture capitalists, um, and that whole venture funding process used to be a black box, and for many people, still is a black box. So we're trying to break that open, make the investors more accessible for startups, help startups get easier access to capital. And um, what's in it for both sides, obviously, the startups need to spend less time in fundraising. They can get access to better investors when they're maybe further away from uh, an ecosystem like Silicon Valley or in Europe, maybe London or Berlin or Paris and um, actually use the internet to connect to those investors. And um, for the investors now, we, um, we enable better deal flow, more diverse deal flow, easier screening of businesses across the world, but also with the new syndicates products, for example, um, an angel investor who doesn't have that much money, but is very skilled in building companies in his particular sector or in a uh, particular geography, can now find followers uh, and pool money around himself uh, to invest larger sums and basically raise his own venture fund um, on our platform. So um, we think this enables the smart investors to pull money around them and do more um, and work better with the entrepreneurs uh, that they want to support. And, and Slava, just to, to summarize what you said, as I understood it, it was we're not just cannibalizing this existing market, but we're going to grow the market significantly for yeah. the kinds of projects on Indiegogo. Yeah, I mean, for me, the uh, many industries these days, the power is moving from the center to the nodes. Uh, if you take, for example, uh, instead of nodes, I don't know, if it, to the outside, to the periphery. And if you look at, for example, the uh, video world or the media world, in most countries, or for example, in the US, there in the 50s or the 60s was just uh, one to three TV channels. And then 15 years later, there became, uh, you know, um, cable. And then there was dozens of channels. And then 15 years later, there's satellites. So then there's uh, hundreds of channels. And then 15 years later, you're today, which now you have thousands or millions of channels. And it's exponentially growing. And it went from three people getting to decide what is always on TV to now anyone decides, because anybody can watch whatever they want and decide that you are a good channel. So that exists. And then still some of the big channels from the 50s still exist. The reason I'm sharing that for this panel is, to me, we're seeing the YouTubization of banking which is banking is going from completely centralized to soon all of us will be able to be a bank, just like all of us are able to be a YouTube producer or viewer. That doesn't mean banks will go away, just like big channels on TV have not gone away. They'll just all evolve and the market will become much bigger. Uh, it's going to be pretty exciting in my opinion. So, so just to take a quick straw poll of the audience, how many people in the audience have pledged money on Indiegogo or Kickstarter or lent money on uh, AUX money or Funding Circle or Lending Club or used angel list. So we're sort of looking at roughly 25% of the room perhaps. So I guess a question you know, for the panel, for the 75% who haven't used any of these platforms, you know, why haven't they been lending money at 6.5% which is much better than what they could get in their bank or why haven't they been looking on AngelList for the next investment opportunity, assuming that they 
have a little bit of money on the side to equity invest? Or why haven't they been scouting on Indiegogo for a great project that will give them a course? You know, what's, what's the sort of marketing problem that each of you guys are facing and how do you overcome it? So for Falk's money, um, maybe I do step back and we do, we do the we do the risk management on behalf of for our for our lenders. So we, um, although we are marketplace, we just don't leave that out for for our lenders to figure out, um, because we feel that um, looking at all thousands of data points, um, which is a highly complex mathematical exercise, we we as a company are better able to to provide that. Uh, that risk management and apply that to the platform. So therefore, I think the preposition really increases over time. And um, we only introduced the scoring and the pricing last year, which is a, a huge advantage for lenders because today uh, lenders can only see projects on the platform that are worth funding. So in the past, it was really um, similar to what Indiegogo does, a very open um, marketplace where there was no curation up front, but that's very different now. As I said at the beginning, 80% of borrowers are excluded up front, and only those which are worth funding are then allowed on the marketplace with an appropriate is, uh, interest rate. So the preposition, so the, the time allowed us to learn, to improve our algorithm, and apply that on the platform. So um, Aux Money today is a very, um, very uh, strong value preposition for investors. Indiegogo, how many people have pledged money roughly so far? Yeah, so we don't give out specific numbers, but it's in the millions. And, and roughly I mean, we just distribute, just to give perspective, we distribute millions of dollars every week uh, to 70 to 100 countries a week. And uh, in Europe, we're definitely a little bit smaller than in the US. And, but just to give you perspective, we're, one of our main important things is to be as global as possible from the beginning. In my opinion, uh, well, right now, this is not opinion, right now Indiegogo is 66% uh, money is coming from the U.S. as well as that's where the money is going. Uh, but still one-third on both sides is actually outside of the U.S., which is good in general, better than any other platform, but access to capital is a completely global phenomenon, and it's a much bigger issue, in my opinion, outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. And instead of using the word U.S., we could use words like, you know, established European countries, meaning it's going to be even bigger and faster in developing countries where you're going to have to skip entire generations of legacy infrastructure where they don't even have banks. And you're starting to see that happen within the next 8, 10 years. I think it's going to be 66 percent outside the established countries. So I think in our case, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple reason why not everybody in this room has put money into a company on AngelList. And that's, we don't want any, everybody to put money into companies on AngelList. We don't want to be the place where you learn about tech in, and startup investments because it's, um, it's a very risky business and we want um, what we call accredited investors on the site. So people who have invested in startups before um, and who want to use the platform to do that in a better and more accessible way. And um, so, yeah, uh, we don't want to be the place where people learn to lose money, is what, what Naval, the founder of Angelus, said, and I think that's a very good um, reason. So, so what's the, the average investment raised by a company on AngelList? So the today. average is about 500K, um, but obviously there's a wild swing. There's a lot of companies who raise in the, in the area of two to 300K. Um, on the syndicates product that we launched, I think um, the average is somewhere around 300. Um, and how many investors new. speak for that 300 or 500? roughly on average. Yeah, so it, again, it depends a little bit and I don't want to bore all of you with the different products. Uh, traditionally, on the introduction business where we um, give startups the chance to reach out to investors and for investors to um, gain more people uh, as, as um, co-investors in the startups that they invest in, uh, usually it would be a traditional angel around maybe five to 10 people. Right, so it's sort of 50, 100K, Per person. Exactly. And on the syndicates model, you can actually, as, as um, an investor, back an individual. So, for example, if I want to follow all of Slava's angel investments on AngelList, I could back him with, say, 2K for the next 10 investments that he does. Might not be so smart. 
<laughs> you know, maybe maybe in in the space of um, of the uh, Indiegogo campaigns that go on to raise money on Angelus, you know who's good, good you know who's successful, and I want to follow that that kind of an investment. So I say I pledge say 10k or 20k for the next year uh, for Slava to invest in those startups, and so do a lot of other people. So there it might be up to 100 people in an individual right. deal. And just to compare Slava on Indiegogo, what's the sort of average? project size and how many investors back it, just to kind of give the audience a feel of the scale of you know, each unique atom. Yeah, so it totally varies. Um, it's kind of like saying, you know, what's the average viewing on uh, YouTube? Um, meaning there's going to be a, a lot of things that don't get much traction and something that gets massive traction, which makes average completely irrelevant. But uh, the sweet spot is, uh, meaning it's very, should we say, easy to just nail is uh, like five to 25,000 US. Um, and that will be somewhere between like 20 to 100 funders, somewhere like that. Um, and then, you know, the bigger campaigns, we have the Ubuntu Edge, uh, $12.8 million in less than 60 days. And then, uh, you know, film, there's lots of campaigns. We were just at Sundance, and uh, there's a good chance that some of the campaigns that get funded on Indiegogo are going to win the top awards for best narrative and best documentary, or just a week prior to that, CES, which is the largest consumer electronics show. Um, we had over 40 companies that were funded at a consumer electronics show. I think over $15 million, over $15 million of money represented that. And the average funder they put in? Oh, yeah, they put in uh, $71 on average. Um, which is the highest amount, I believe, on any platform out there. And uh, that also varies, though, by vertical. So, for example, in a product, uh, that average is a little bit higher, uh, while in theater, that average is lower. And on AUX money, what's the sort of average money uh, loaned you know, per investor? So the average amount per loan per investor is like 123 euros, to be very precise. Um, so that means on an average, um, you have roughly about uh, 60, 70 backers per loan. Yeah. So, so let's talk just for a minute or two about what motivates these providers of money. Because you know, it's 70 bucks, 50K, 123 euros. You know, uh, some of them are wanting to make a profit, but you know, what else could be in their minds as they, they make these investments? Yeah, so I always uh, talk about this. People, especially when I talk to VCs, uh, just so you know, we got turned down by almost 90 VCs uh, when we were trying to raise money for three years. We were bootstrapped. We got absolutely zero money for three years. And that was during the market crash of 2008, 2009. And then, uh, I mean, a year and a half ago, we raised a $15 million A round. But the reason I bring that up is because the VCs always say why, especially in the early days, why would any moron like fund this? Like they don't get any profit back. This is ridiculous. So there's really four reasons why anybody funds anything in life, not on Indiegogo in life. And those four things, and this is also covered underneath here with all of us, which is number one, they care about the person or the cause or the idea, which is often called passion. Sometimes people use the word donate, and that's a legal word for tax purposes. Number two is they want the perks. So most of you probably paid for your shoes. We call that perks. Number three is people want to be part of something bigger than themselves, or they want to be part of a community or a movement. So we call that participate. And number four is they want profit. They want to give $1 and get $5 back. And uh, the incredible thing in life is the same exact thing. Four different people might have four completely different reasons why they fund that, which is the beauty of this whole marketplace. And I think you categorize into four points. Number one and number four uh, don't have to be mutually exclusive. So you can invest into a project because you like the idea, you like the course, but you can still make a return of that. And that's basically what happens on AUX money um, a lot. I mean, this is certainly which falls into category number four, which is uh, people looking for, for a good return on their capital. But also you see a lot like, you know, golfer supporting younger golfers when they're starting to um, uh, starting to take lessons and so on, and taking a loan for this, and but they st at the same time have the have the visibility on getting the money back with a return on it. So, so it, as a hypothesis, is is one of the disruptive common threads here that if we're 
eating or hollowing out banks, you know, traditionally the bank lender or bank manager was a, a very dispassionate, kind of pure by the numbers analyst of, of a business opportunity. And, and you're providing, uh, an op uh, if you like, a direct connection to individuals who might want to invest for other reasons. In, in some cases, those reasons being much more powerful than a profit motive. Um, I think we'll disagree on this um, here on the panel, but in our case, uh, that's certainly not the case. So it's it's really about the numbers. It is about the likelihood of repayment, and um, you know there are so many data points you can look at and predict the likelihood of a repayment. Um, so the social aspect um, has less of a role in terms of making an investment. On the other hand, on the recipient side, on the borrower side. Um, we feel that you are more likely to repay to other people than to repay to, to a bank which you might not like. So the social aspect certainly kicks in on that side of the marketplace. I think you know, banks should exist and there should be people who look at the numbers in detail and make sure that some money comes back. Um, I think what's important is that all three of our platforms allow different things to happen, which traditionally just technolo technologically weren't possible. Um, and I mean, I think the, the essence of angel investing is very much, I want to help uh, young entrepreneurs succeed and I want to help build these businesses. And um, I think anybody in, in the venture business is extremely passionate about helping build companies. Um, so, but we still need to make money as a platform. We still need to make um, and help make those decisions. Uh, we need to help uh, make that process more efficient and that's why Angelist exists. Each one of the industries that uh, Indiegogo touches is usually constrained by its capacity um, of what it can actually hold in terms of inventory or what it can distribute. So for example, it touches the film industry. The film industry is decided by how many theaters are there and what movie can I put in this theater because I can only decide which movie I can put there. Or how many clothes am I going to put into this store because I only have these many racks, whether it's physically in the front or digitally, I only have this much space, so I have to make my decisions as to what will sell well next quarter. Or if I'm a bank, I have to figure out how to use my capital to make sure that I allocate it to the right people so I get the best return which is all fine and good, they could all be doing that stuff, but why is it in a world that's getting decentralized that I need to rely on their distribution and capacity constraints to be able to establish that marketplace? Meaning, if there's a small business, and this is a true story, that wants to start a gluten-free dessert cookie shop, and they already have two years of revenues, which actually passes the threshold of even banks should be allowed to give them a loan. So if you don't even have two years of revenues, they won't even qualify you for getting a loan, right? So now you even have, why is it that if they say no, I shouldn't be able to get a loan? Meaning it's just because of this bank's capacity constraints. Maybe the world says it's okay. The world doesn't have the same capacity constraints. So Indiegogo is just moving the power from the middle to the nodes for everybody. The crowd can decide whatever they want. A question for each of you. If you were not running your own business today and you had to choose another crowdfunding platform or site to run, which would you choose and why? I'll answer that question. We actually, uh, we're a completely open marketplace, so meaning literally anybody can raise money for absolutely anything, so much so that since we've invented this industry, we've had many companies get funded on Indiegogo to compete with Indiegogo. So when I come up with this company, I would get, probably get it funded on Indiegogo, um, so that'd be fun. But I think that um, you see that the media world, so the written word first, then music, then film, and then other things as well, which is you see them getting disrupted and as you even said, hollowed out in the middle where you have to be a really big bet or a really small company. I think that the only reason finance hasn't been touched yet is because it has a lot of regulation. And finally that regulation is coming down because people are seeing that things that were passed in 1933 or the 40s or 50s are actually completely archaic. So, I mean, I think finance is gonna be exciting, but I will probably start a company in one of the next three highly regulated industries which are gonna follow finance and in the next 15 years be really exciting, which is energy, education, and uh, healthcare. Yeah, so I would... Please, please be a little more specific if you can and pick a company. No, I... You want me to start a company right now? Um, I would want to 
run a company that helps uh, people educate themselves. So be that student loans as probably the most understandable um, product there, but also allowing people, you know, in 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 places where education isn't easy to access uh, to finance themselves. And I think that is probably um, that will probably be Ox Money. Um, because it's obviously focused at consumers or end cus end customers getting money, so um, but you know it but might for the purposes might as well of be student loans. Sorry, for the purposes of student loans, because that's a, a thing that you'd like to support. Um, student loans, uh, as I said, is probably the most easily understood um, product. I think the student loan business, especially in the U.S., is completely messed up. Um, and you know the fact that you need student loans to study is completely messed up. But uh, you know in other markets uh, it's much more difficult to get access to education, and very often it's just a, a question of money. So be that families sending their kids to primary school or high school, um, I think that kind of stuff uh, can have a massive impact. Do I need to answer? <laughs> no. um, so if you're suggesting AUX money, we, we might be able to swap in a couple of years. It might be an idea. No, basically, I think um, what you guys are doing in terms of crowd investing is a very, very smart approach. And all these different funding platforms are, you know, where one stop, the next one already begins. Um, and and, and seeing, seeing more of the various verticals that get funded um, being merged, I think that will be an interesting trend to watch going forward. And if you just stay on crowd lending side, you have crowd lending sides in the US for, for mortgage loans, for corporate loans, for consumer loans. Um, and I think we will see, we will see more of that, we'll see more of that in Europe and definitely um, want to be a part of, of uh, player consolidating uh, the, the various verticals. So, so Slava just brought up um, the question of regulation and you know, an open question for all of you is, you know, is, is government here a help is it, or, or is it a hindrance? You know, how, how do you think about the regulatory environment for, you know, w w you, know you are disrupting what is a, historically a highly regulated industry, involves money. Um, there are various ways to look at this. So in Germany, um, the government pretty much stays out of regulation of crowdfunding sites, um, which is a good and a bad thing at the same time. Um, it, it would be a good thing in terms of having very clear uh, guidelines. Um, but on the other hand, um, obviously we're very close to the regulator, so having figured out how to do is also very competitive. Uh, very big competitive advantage. But what we see in the UK, for example, where the government very much support, actively supports uh, crowdfunding um, by even lending, I mean, in terms of setting regulation, as of April this year, uh, crowdfunding uh, will be regulated in the UK. And I think that's a great example uh, for other countries to follow. So that's a regulatory part, but there's also the part where the government actively becomes a lender yeah. and co-invests alongside other private yeah, investors, I, I, and I think that's a very strong... The, the banks in the UK are, are, are not doing this well enough, and so the government's trying to work through these platforms directly, which is uh, you know, forward-thinking or vote-winning, depending on how you want to look at it. It's not, they're not investing large sums of money, but they're, they're, they're cheerleading. So I think the government um, obviously is in a position where it's hard to please everybody. They need to protect their consumers. And so for in our case, um, investing into equity um, openly, so general solicitation, telling people publicly that you raise money is forbidden in most countries because in the 30s, you know, during the Great Depression, a lot of people touted penny stocks and crappy investments to the public, um, making, you know, your great-grandma invest uh, her money into those stocks and all was lost. So that's why a lot of uh, rules are in place still today. And the governments are actively looking to change that. So the US with the Jobs Act started to change that. The European Union um, on, on different levels is starting to change that. Italy has a great um, crowdfunding regulation uh, regime. France is passing new regulation in February. Uh, Germany in April. Uh, the, U uh, the UK is also um, doing new 
thing. So I think the government is trying to open this up, but also um, we as the providers of these services need to help the government understand what is actually going on um, in order to, to do it the right way and, uh, and not just blow everything open because we don't want it shut down again in, say, uh, three or four or five years uh, if something should go wrong. Yeah, so I mean, I would agree with everything he just said, so I'll just build on top of that and just give you an example. So um, Nikola Tesla um, is one of the people who helped to create electricity and found electricity, and he has a uh, laboratory, <coughs> his old laboratory in uh, New York State, and the laboratory was actually just private uh, land. It wasn't any government land, and they were going to uh, sell it, and the rumor was that they were gonna sell it for $1.7 million, the original laboratory, and it was gonna get turned into a Dunkin' Donuts, which is like a coffee shop in America. And people got really upset about that, so they went to their New York State government, and they said, you need to stop this, because this is not appropriate. And the government said, we can't, this is not government property, there's no sanction, this is just private land, we can't stop this. So then these individuals decided to create their own organization, and. They're like, we're going to try to raise the money to buy this for $1.7 million, but it was going to happen in the next several weeks. And they're like, government, you need to step in. And they're like, we can't. This is taxpayer money. We can't do this. So then I think just because they were trying to be nice and tell them to go away, New York State government said, hey, listen, if you can raise $850,000, we'll give you the other $850,000 so you can buy it for $1.7 million. But like, I think they probably said it just to be like, go away. Right, because how are you going to raise $850,000 in like a month? So what happened was they actually went on Indiegogo and they raised the money. They raised actually $1.4 million out of $850,000. And New York State government then applied $850,000. The reason I'm sharing that example is in my opinion, remember what I'm saying about centralized versus going out to the nodes? Why does the government need to decide where all your taxpayer money goes? It's your money. Just allocate certain tax dollars on the side and you'll get it allocated against matching funds, so the government will actually match things through your money that you want to have matched. In short, you'll have more control over your own tax dollar allocation. So, I mean, that's the future for me. I, I want to make sure we have some time for questions from the floor, but... Um, but before we do that, I guess just you know one more question f for the panel, which is when you look at marketplace businesses online and you know, eBay being the sort of archetype, they tend to concentrate into sort of winner takes all, where liquidity becomes uh, centralized in, in in one place. Obviously, there are as you mentioned, you know a thousand plus crowdfunding and crowd lending sites and each of you are active in different segments and different countries and so it's not necessarily the right hypothesis that there's going to be one company in the future but do, do, are you sort of operating under the principle that this will consolidate quite quickly and there will be winners in different segments or do you think like in the banking world it will be more oligopolistic or um, shared as, as, as an outcome. Um, speaking for, for the crowd lending industry, um, I think it, it is a winner-takes-it-all market, at least locally. So um, there can be a big player in the UK and there can be a big player in the UK and they, uh, in Germany and they wouldn't compete against each other. And that's mainly because of regulation. So it's a very local play. Um, and there are huge benefits of being, having a big marketplace in terms of crowd lending, which is basically the data that you have um, about historic uh, payment behavior. And that's a huge advantage. So if you want to grow the marketplace on the lender side, they want on the investor side, they want to see that you have done it right for the last couple of years, you can prove that it works, and then they're going to commit bigger amount of capital. On the same time, if you have that bigger amount of capital available, also on the borrower side, um, you are able to, to, um, to go much quicker, to give quicker funding, um, and mm -hmm. uh, even instant loan decisions to borrowers, if you have the capital available up front. Um, and I think a trend we will see more and more is um, 
whereas today it's a peer-to-peer -peer lending, private to private, you, you, you will see more institutional investors also coming uh, on these platforms like Aux Money and investing uh, big amounts of capital. But again, they want to see a five-year track record and see that it really works. So the, 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 the benefit um, of being huge, being around for a couple of years is huge. Therefore, why, that, why I think it will naturally fall into a winner-takes-it-all model. Okay, Slava? I mean, to be provocative here for a second, uh, winner take all to me is like a business school or a VC concept that people just like saying. Um, they always want to use examples like eBay, and if eBay won it all already, so how come Amazon's doing so well? Or they use YouTube, and if YouTube's you won it all, how come Netflix is doing okay? Point is, um, what you can winner take all in any segment that you want. You can make it small enough to say like you want it all, but you want it all in like nothing. Or you really what you need to do is just focus on creating a company or a product that people want and keep building that. And in a marketplace, which all three of us actually have, scale uh, does help. Um, I don't know that uh, winner take all is as relevant. It all depends on what you consider the market. The market for access to capital, I mean, just think about it for a second. It's like all the money that goes around the world. That's a big market. So, and I don't think it's gonna go away. Whether it's like Bitcoin is the new currency or the moon is the new geography, access to capital will always be an issue because even if you democratize in a way that certain other people now get it, it will probably create a system that other people didn't get it as much. So there'll always be the requirement to have access to capital. So. Um, that was a roundabout answer to say focus on your product and not a winner take all concept. That's okay. Uh, I, I can keep it short. I think it's uh, the bigger you are, the more successful you are because so much of it has to do with networks. And the bigger the networks are, the faster the money will move, um, the bigger the companies that get funded or the, the loans that can get funded um, are. So I think the bigger each of us will get, the more successful they will build a business. Right. So, any questions from the uh, from the audience? We've got time for probably two or three. Yeah. Gentleman in blue. Question for, for Slava and for Rafael. You, you just mentioned Bitcoin. What's, what's your perspective on that? Are you considering to accept it? Your platforms? Yeah, so I mean, we just added euros like seven months ago. <laughs> so... I mean, <laughs> what's that? <coughs> I can't what? Euros, what's euros? Come on. No, so, That's a Pontus scheme. No, we've grown 300% in Europe in the last 12 months. Um, so I don't really get too caught up in Bitcoin or not. I think Bitcoin is interesting from a personal perspective. Really what matters is um, if you actually want to know the challenge for Indiegogo, is Bitcoin is just quote unquote another currency. The thing is, every country has its own payment methodologies and its own payments issues, and anybody who's German knows that Germany has its very own way of doing payments. So if you want to talk about should we do Bitcoin or not, or how complicated is Bitcoin, just multiply that by the fact that there's like 190 countries, and that's the, exactly the decision process that I have to go through every single country before I decide about Bitcoin. There's a Bitcoin syndicate you can follow on AngelList, and um, it's pretty big already, so definitely people are interested in investing in companies that do something yeah. with Bitcoin. I so. mean, there's been a bunch of companies funded on Indiegogo that are Bitcoin companies, like wallets and stuff like that. Uh, another question, please. Uh, I have an industry question uh, for Slava. What do you think is going to happen to the publishing industry? Uh, right now, the standard is that an advance gets paid to an author. Uh, with this advance in the future, be paid by uh, through crowdfunding. Um, books are, for instance, a hard to explain product, but will it happen? Yeah, I mean, um, journalism or book writing is just like any other media, which is, again, it's based on its capacity constraints of bookshelves or how many books somebody can represent as an agent. So. Um, I don't think that you have to go through them. That doesn't mean that they will go away. They'll have their own value add. But absolutely, we already have millions of dollars of books being funded or journalism. And the beautiful thing is back to the feedback loops. See, if you go through XYZ Publisher and you then launch through XYZ Store Bookstore, 
The thing is, you didn't get any of that other stuff except for maybe the money. Remember what those things were? Number one, market validation, which then could have gotten you a better deal with those two entities because you could have negotiated better. Number two is you could have got more marketing because you would be getting it through your actual crowd. Number three, you could have been testing what to go with or not. And the most powerful thing, hands down, is the relationship. See, in that situation, if you didn't go on Indiegogo, you have no idea who bought your book. You can't even follow up with them. You can't even thank them. And when you come out with a new chapter that you want to put on iTunes, you can't even tell them it exists. You need to find them again. How stupid is that? But just to add to that, I think the crowdfunding sites um, like Indiegogo are ideal for, for content where traditionally you would, uh, as a content creator, you would create your content, try to uh, protect it with trademarks and all this. And now, you know, you basically turn that around and say, and people would be able to copy that particular online content. Now you turn that around and actually say, I'm going to produce content if enough people would back me, and then you, um, that problem goes away. And I think, particularly for, for the industry you mentioned, this is, this is an ideal solution here. Another question. The lady. Hi, uh, I uh, live in San Francisco and I've been working with Oric Law Firm. And I've had a software company for about 12 years. They were discouraging me from working with some of these platforms. Um, I am, however, in dialogue with, with Indiegogo for a documentary film that's been, that I've produced. Uh, and I was just wondering about your, your input on uh, their, why they would, they would deter um, moving toward a, uh, this type of fundraising versus the traditional? I mean, I can't speak to it specifically. Um, I mean, I could say I know Oryx, so it's surprising because they actually used to represent us. But, um, but I would say, I would generalize your question to this, which is, um, what about copyright protection? What about my stuff getting stolen? What about fraud? What about all that? So I'll generalize it to that's probably some of their concerns. Is that accurate? Yeah, so my, that's the general question. And in my opinion, that sort of thinking is legacy thinking from 20 years ago. See, the ROI analysis of the benefit you can get to have exposure and transparency versus the negatives you can get from actually copying or whatever, it used to weigh heavily on the negative, meaning there was not much positive to exposing. There were no social networks, there was no Indiegogo, there was none of this stuff, right? Fast forward 20 years, it's actually, in my opinion, it's not like a 50-50 coin flip. It's like a 95-5. I would say, in my opinion, it's 100-0, which is all the benefits that you get from the exposure and transparency massively outweigh any of the potential negative. And if you want to get into a legal discussion, you could actually discuss the fact that from an IP perspective, the fact that you do own it on Indiegogo is one of the ways that you can show the copy. Anyway, point is, there's a lot of legal answers as well to that question. So I have a, a separate question to that, but uh, it, it is, I guess, adjacent or somewhat related, which is, you know, in, in the academic literature, there's a lot of debate around the wisdom of crowds and how potentially the people could be better allocators of capital than central organizations. There's also a, an equal weighting of literature about the madness of crowds and how popular uh, if you like, um, kind of craziness can kind of lead folks in the wrong direction. So with these kinds of platforms, are we going to see both the best and the worst of kind of humankind? Is, is, is that a fair prediction? I would guess so. <laughs> I think it's in the, uh, in the hands of those platforms to manage uh, manage that and to see if there is any curation or if you can rely on uh, curation by the crowd or not. So um, we talked about this topic before and you have a very uh, analytical approach at Ox Money to uh, figuring out who should and shouldn't actually be shown on the platform. We took the approach of um, having lead investors for the deals that go on the platform where other investors can co-invest and, and vet those lead investors as uh, good angel or technology investors and and you have your own uh, way of doing it which is definitely putting much more power in the hands of the crowd um, but also you uh, you show the um, uh, the consumer and the the purchaser of of a perk or, or the supporter of a project what uh, who s selected um, the uh, the project to be um, 
on top or not. So yeah. I think last word, I think we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. OK, so I'll try to be profound. Imagine asking Google if it was OK to be in their search algorithms. Imagine asking YouTube if it was OK to put up a video. Imagine asking Twitter if it was OK to put up a tweet. Point is, all of them have exactly what you're referring to, which is things that some people might like and things that other people might not. And it's in the hands of the product and the feedback of the people to be able to create a discovery and experience that everybody will like, whatever that is. So I think open is better. So thank you, Slava, Philip, Raphael, for a great panel. <laughs>